Um, one of the big stories of the year that I feel like hasn't got the attention that it should have, and maybe it's just because of all the things in the world, is Nancy mm-hmm. French's reporting on Canacuck. Mm-hmm. Um, the Canacuck yeah. camp is probably the most influential Christian camp in the United States. And yeah. in regards to the amount of uh, reach that they have, the number of campers that go there, and the number of Christian influencers that send their children there. Yeah. I, um, it is very expensive. It's very, I was going to say, it's I like the never, elite place for the fancy folks to send. I was never cool enough or rich enough for Canacook, um, but it, it it is very culturally influential because it's where, it's where Christians of privilege send their kids. Yeah. And yeah. they, you know, have relationships with other people. I mean, mm-hmm. I can think of really influential people. I feel like Jenny Allen uh, had a connection to Canacook. I know everybody, everybody <laughs> a lot of the Nashville evangelical industrial complex um, send their children it's there. It's very ubiquitous mm-hmm. in white evangelical culture from the 90s to now. Like yeah. if you grew up in that time period, and you like sports or your parents had money or you, you know, were like the cool youth group kid. If you have money and you're somebody in the Christian world, it was very, it's very common to send your kid to this camp. Mm-hmm. And what has really been disappointing is I don't, I haven't heard anything from any of those folks yeah. that have influence and have the ear of a lot of people. Yeah. In fact, I think they probably, many of them just kept sending their kids. Mm-hmm. And like, like the too long didn't read is that they had employees, one in particular, was there more than one? I know that there's, one in particular, there's more than one, but they're really like sexual abuser, yeah. um, has been, um, convicted. Mm-hmm. Um, and instead of making, instead of being really clear with parents and campers of what has happened to reach out and let people know and to find the full impact of what has happened and all of the survivors, Mm -hmm. um, they shut down survivors. They like bribed them Mm -hmm. to be quiet, bought them Mm -hmm. like technology and asked them to sign away their right to speak about it, which Mm -hmm. is horrifying. I mean, you think you send your kids away and it's scary anyways, you need to trust that they are in good hands. Yeah. And I am surprised that it hasn't, more people haven't cared I think, I think you're right about the, the number of influential people with ties to Canacook who have said not a single word or who have said, I had a great experience there. Like that, that's like, like I, that, you know, it's back to the, you know, papering over your harm with good. Like when, when we judge whether or not something is bad based only on our relationship with it yeah and not on how it affects other people then we're making ourselves the center of what is good and what is not good and and so it's another ends justify the means thing yeah and and the and the least powerful ends up being the most hurt Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and i actually want to zoom out a little bit again and and talk about this in the context of another issue which is the sort of QAnonification of talking about child abuse oh um, yeah within the american church like i um people that know me know that i have been like hey this is bad <laughs> um about QAnon being sort of mainstreamed into evangelical culture for years like the whole save the children thing and wayfair and and basically like things from the dark depths of the dark web being mainstreamed into influencer instagram and and facebook memes and all these things and and so and so what happens is you have all of these conspiracies right about groomers and pedophiles and elementary schools and and all of these things and and there's and and they're based on nothing Mm -hmm. um at best (laughs) right Mm -hmm. but but it's it's sort of in the water it's in the air and it it kind of has been for a while and and people haven't really noticed it they've they've acclimated to this 
it, it's like when there's like a okay so when I was a trainer in high school for football um there was a cat that kept getting into our visitor locker room area and storage area and it would get in there and it would pee on like the you know like the um sports like uh industrial carpet that's just like carpet uh, over a concrete yes, floor right yes <clears throat> and so our coach's office like our like our changing areas and storage areas smelled like cat pee and like you like I'd spray like disinfectant on it and like the disinfectant would like clean it but like the cat pee smell never really went away but I was in there every day and I got to where I kind of couldn't smell it anymore right mm. but then other football teams would come and um and they would be like there's something dead in here because <laughs> they would walk in and smell it and then I would have to be like oh no that it's cat pee in the carpet it's cleaned I promise we just can't get rid of the smell like and and so I would forget that it smelled like cat pee because mm -hmm. it was just the air that I breathed every day but when someone would walk in they would smell it right and that's kind of what has happened with the sort of cunanification of child abuse in our culture mm -hmm. is that we've all been acclimated to the cat pee. And, and so now when someone like Nancy French does real investigative journalism with real harm and real victims and real proof, right? Like legal mm -hmm. proof, then it's just lost because the air just already smells bad. Yeah. And so and so the these these two things live together, right? Of this being underreported and not and not mattering like it should. Yeah. I think that coexists in a in a in a sort of symbiotic way with with our noses being poisoned by cat pee of of this sort of rumor pedophile hysteria. Yeah. That that makes that makes it so that we don't either we think that everything is it or we think that nothing is it and so it's made us sort of culturally incapable of taking real mm. things seriously because ridiculous things have been called real for so long does that make sense yeah it to totally does i was clicking over here because i was remembering that shannon martin had shared a thread on twitter recently that was very uh connected to this it was way back at way back and in november um, and she said, white evangelicals, 10 out of 10, prefer what they can't see to what they can see. Hmm. And it shows, I'm going to read this. She says, there are people being oppressed, dying from racism, homophobia, gun violence, and poverty, and they'd rather talk about the end times. Five-year-olds are being shot to death during circle time. They'd rather talk about the unborn. An insurrection took place on live TV. They'd rather talk about a riot they heard about from Sean Hannity. While COVID deaths were stacking up in hospital hallways, they want to talk about Wayfair cabinets and rumors of satanic cabals. We have mm -hmm. broken healthcare, broken schools, cities with, without safe drinking water, mass incarceration, modern slavery. They want to talk about focusing on joy, daily quiet time, not being divisive, and Israel. 90% do not know why they're supposed to throw this last one around, the Israel one. Uh, yeah, it, it is so fascinating. We have the 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 proof that something is actually happening and there's much more of a, but what about mm -hmm. the theoretical thing that maybe most likely hundred percent was made up, right? There are some real things like the unborn is real, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this Wayfair thing and all mm -hmm. these other things of, and Christians saying, you know, I have to support Trump because of child abuse and trafficking. Mm -hmm. Well, what, okay what about this real child abuse case that's happening that yeah nobody is talking about 